Welcome Winnipeg fans all across the U.S. and Canada. You're now boarding the Winnipeg Terminal. Uh, terminal, Yeah, Terminal. I'm your host, Mike Dandria, along with Joe Pritchard. Joe, how's it going this week? Uh, I'm praying for rain tomorrow night here so that I can catch the start of the bomber game. My boy's got a <laughs> T-ball game at 645, kickouts at 730. Worst case scenario, I miss the first quarter and catch up tomorrow or Friday morning anyway. But... I'd like to be there when they kick off this year. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, you know, by trade, I'm a meteorologist, and the clouds will hang around for tomorrow, but I don't know about rain. Uh, it doesn't look like, especially later in the day, uh, it doesn't necessarily look like that's the case. So I hate to rain on your parade, so to speak. But yeah, and, and, little... and you have no say over this? You get no magic trick you can pull for me? Maybe I'll have to talk to my boss about it. Give it a shot. <laughs> we got uh, we got a lot to talk about today, though. We've got, obviously, season opener. we got a lot of CFL news and a little bit of NHL news with the Jets as well. And uh, we've got a lot to dive into. So thank you for joining us. And sit back, relax, and enjoy the Winnipeg Terminal. Dive right into this bad boy. So, Joe, I'll have you take the lead on this one since we've got a lot of CFL news, and I think that one kind of goes without saying, and then I'll kind of dive into a little bit of what's going on with the Jets. So give me uh, give me your thoughts on the, the game this week against Montreal. Of course. It has to be the Great Cup rematch, right? Can't just jump into week one against maybe an opponent of a lesser caliber, get your feet under you. No, yeah, you no. couldn't start off against Edmonton. Yeah, right. Uh, TV ratings uh, trump all. And I'm just trying to remind myself that, hey, a bunch of the starters haven't played at all in the preseason. The few that did played a few, few plays and were out. Don't get over. Don't get too excited one way or the other for how week one goes, because really the first month is a little bit messier than the rest of the season usually is. But mm -hmm. I have to say, given how much talent is coming back, I feel good. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 I struggled with it through from when preseason kicked off a few weeks ago because the two preseason games we got to see were messy and ugly because no starters were playing. So conversely, it's like, ah, oh, this doesn't feel great. But wait, it doesn't matter at all because we're picking like three guys to go along with the rest of the team that's coming back. So relax <laughs> it isn't great to have Strebler back too i mean like you know wilson's had his you know ups and downs of course third string but it's it's nice to have Strebler back in uh back in blue isn't it? it it is it's gonna be a lot of fun to see him on the short yardage because there's so many things the team does with him uh second and one is my favorite play and as much, <laughs> as, as, much as i as much as i cringe a little bit when zach's not on the field just the ability to use the whole field on second and one means either you're getting that conversion every time if you're going to sneak it, or if they're going to play up for Streveler, he knows what to do. Mm -hmm. It gives you a whole nother dynamic as opposed to as opposed to just having a standard uh, short yardage offense in the CFL, which everybody knows you're running the quarterback sneak 95% oh, sure. of the time. Stre with Streveler. A, you have a fullback at quarterback, so that helps. And B, you can't rely on stacking the box on him because if you do that and you leave one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside, he might try to take that shot. 
Oh, for sure. And like now that he's kind of seasoned a little bit with some NFL experience too, um, what he was with Arizona and New York. And I don't know if there was another stop uh, in his little NFL tour. If it was just those two teams, I'd have to look that one up. I but, think those uh, are the two teams he played regular season games with anyway. Yeah. And like, you know, obviously the, the way it is now, it seems like the NFL is a lot more of a passing game than it used to be. Even, you know, like remember 20 years ago, a lot of teams, Chicago Bears and Pittsburgh Steelers uh, were two big ones of the ground and pound. But now it's a quarterback's game as far as passing. So I'd love to see that kind of dynamic that he can bring back to the CFL now, uh, you know, having been in the NFL for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, it's going it, to – I feel comfortable if Zach takes a minor injury and is out for a few games that Strevler will be able to move the ball enough for the team to play about 500 ball or the time that Kolaris is out. If it's mm -hmm. long-term, maybe I worry a little bit more, but two, three, four games, batting 500 and those won't really hurt. Do you think that Wilson's going to step up and be the guy here soon? Well, not soon, but like soon as in the next couple of years, uh, once we presumably uh, move on from Kalaros? Well, I'm assuming that Kalaros would make that decision himself. So hopefully it's not us moving on, and hopefully it's him walking away after uh, holding one more Grey Cup. I'll take that. That'd be nice. That, that's, that's the Hollywood ending for me. Um I don't know. I didn't love what I saw out of Wilson, albeit in probably about a game's worth of action. He was showing the ability to hit the short stuff. If the long stuff wasn't there, he knew where to go for the short stuff. That's a problem for a lot of quarterbacks to figure out. Uh, like, say, Vernon Adams in last year's West Final. <laughs> Right? Where yeah. everything he tried to do was 20 yards downfield. Wilson knew when to take the short stuff, but the problem is he wasn't connecting in the long stuff. So eventually the defense is going to go, okay, we dare you to throw long and take the short stuff away. But again, it was probably about a game's worth of action with second slash third stringers. So I could see some development could happen. I mean, he's already 26. There's, there's only so much time left to develop. But Right. Maybe another like two years worth of development before it's like he's kind of set in his ways. Right. And then it, it was a much better showing from him than anybody else besides what Strebler had the one drive in the first game, I think. Right. And I mean, it wasn't the result that we wanted, but it's the preseason. Well, exactly. I, I, I would have liked to see better out of the return game too. Uh, they did have the big long return. Uh, and of course, the returner got hurt and is no longer on the team because of that. Uh, yeah. I could think he could come back. He might not. We'll see. Uh, but I would have liked to see a little bit more consistency out of the return game because we're going into the season without Janier and Grant, who's in Toronto. Looks like Myron Mitchell's going to get the first crack at it. So we'll see what we'll see what comes of that. But losing the dynamic like game changer that Grant is for the games he's healthy for, which was part of the problem. Right. That hurts. But you can't have everything on a CFL roster. There's only so much room. Yeah. And I mean, too, like, you know, when you only have a handful of teams, like, of course, the, the talent pool, some like to look at the CFL, and I might get a lot of hate for saying this, some like to look at the CFL as a lesser league than the NFL. And, you know, there might be a little bit of merit to that, but the games are different. And when you have a talent pool of way less teams than the NFL, of course, that's not going to be as stretched as thin. So it's a little bit more competitive. So you really can't have every, you know, top guy on a team. No, no, especially so. especially when it's a position like a kick returner where you can't throw a lot of money at it. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing, the financial aspect of it, too. Um, right. I mean, now, the Bombers had to throw money at Oliveira and Dalton Schoen, so it's got to come from somewhere, right? Exactly. Now, what are your thoughts on the defense this, we'll just say week one. I was going to say this year, but we'll kind of just leave it to week one for now. Well, we'll see. We're facing an offense that knows what they're doing. Uh, I mean, Montreal is going to be down um, Austin Mack. 
back who went to the NFL, but they get Cam Julian Grant back. They're going to be in decent shape. Uh, they don't have William Stan back anymore, but Walter Fletcher, Jesswin Entwi, who was out, were good at their roles. And Cody Fajardo showed everybody a lot of stuff last November, unfortunately, for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have good coaching on, on the offense and defense. So it's going to be a tough battle. Uh, I'm not going to sit there and go, I think Winnipeg's going to win by 21. That's just not happening. This is a, even though the regular season games last year between Montreal and Winnipeg went dramatically Winnipeg's way, by the time we got to November, it was a different Montreal team. So against that team with their coaching, and it's a good matchup. I'm going to, it's going to be a game you're going to want to get your popcorn out for. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. But, um, can we just uh, can we make a uh, sort of pact now? Can we just not mention Cody Fajardo's name on this podcast anymore after that time? I just did. He earned it. <laughs> no, just 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 no. No, he <laughs> he, he, he earned, earned all the credit. All the credit he's getting. He was undermanned in Saskatchewan and undercoached. So good for him, and I'm glad he wasn't wearing green when he won. Yeah, I suppose that makes it a little better, but still. Now, yeah, it's, we did... it, I still feel the cold in my bones, though, from when Phil Pot caught that pass. <laughs> <laughs> the temperature apparently dropped 30 degrees in, in the time between when Fajardo threw the ball and when Phil Pot caught it. <laughs> I swear that happened. Now, I wanted. Um... I wanted to just dive into one thing real quick. I know I'm kind of jumping around here and I don't normally like to do that. I like some smooth transitions, but um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the situation that's going on with the Jets right now um, in that we actually were just putting together our show. I'll kind of break the fourth wall here. We were putting together our show notes today and then I see a headline about uh, Winnipeg interested in re-signing Sean Monahan, And of course, I think most, if it was a choice between Monahan and Toffoli, I think a lot of Jets fans would probably side with Monahan because Toffoli is great, but he just couldn't find his game with Winnipeg. Now, granted, he was a later addition, but um, what are your thoughts? If you had to pick between the two of them, Toffoli or Monahan, who would you pick? I think Monahan's a better fit for what's going on, at least power play wise, because the difference between him and the power play beforehand was night and day. Uh, it Speaking of got a Winnipeg and Montreal. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. No, when he showed up, the power play returned to action, so to speak. It was dead before that. Uh, didn't stay that hot, but it's hard to stay that hot. Um, the one thing I worry about is it doesn't seem like he has the foot speed required for the kind of defense Winnipeg likes to play. So the question is, is, is there a problem five on five there? Because really from that trade, from about that time of that trade, we were talking about Winnipeg being dominant on five on five and the PK and the, and the power play and the PK weren't so hot. After that, the five on five started to slip a bit, and the special teams got a little bit better. Right, and it, it, you could it happened around then. I don't think you could put the full, "Hey, this is what happened" on Monahan, but I wonder right. if that did, didn't have a little bit to do with it anyway. Mm-hmm. Or was it some of the coaching decisions surrounding? Hey, we have Monahan now. Where does everybody fit? Did they put the puzzle pieces together the way they wanted to? Mm-hmm. Or at least the way that would have worked best. And now it helps that they have uh, they they're trying to establish more of an identity. They they hi- hired a coach now, and it's one obviously that's been uh, interim bench boss in the absence of bonus. Um, you know when he was away, and I mean, I I really do miss Rick Bonus already. But mm-hmm. I think that Arneal is going to. I, I think that he's going to keep that kind of identity that they had during the regular season. The only thing that I'm hoping doesn't happen is when they're facing adversity, when their backs are up against the wall, 
that they don't bow to the other team's identity, which is exactly what happened. We were definitely playing Colorado's game uh, in that playoff series, which was kind of hard to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, But nonetheless, like it, it helps that they have somewhat of an identity now. And now the question is, does Nikolai Ehlers fall into that sort of identity? Because we were talking about speed before, uh, which is something that he obviously has a lot of. Uh, or is he going to remain on the trading block? Yeah, we'll have to see. Because when Arneal was covering for bonus uh, during the health issues, it felt like the team was playing better. Yeah. It, it, the advantage of having Scott Arneal take over is that he already knows what's going on in the locker room. He knows how the pieces could fit together. He kn- knows how they did fit together last year. He's not coming in f- with fresh, e- with completely fresh eyes, but he may be coming in with a fresh perspective where he could make the final decision now as opposed to being the second in command where you're not making the final call. He might have different ways of doing things. It's not going to be that much different than what you've already got built because he's been there for the building process. Mm-hmm. But maybe he, maybe he, maybe he would help make that, that last switch you need, like put the right person on the f- first line, right person on the second line. Both lines get better as a result. He might have a different idea of how to do that than Rick Bonus did, and that seemed to be the criticism we were we were seeing late in the season, where it doesn't seem like the puzzle pieces are fitting right right now. Yeah, and maybe and Neil has a different that I thought, noticed... or maybe he doesn't. Who knows? Maybe maybe he's got maybe he's of the same mind but even then you have you still have your same structure as you did last year and that structure won you 55 games so that's yeah nothing to shake a stick at there now correct me if i'm wrong on this but i also noticed when arneal was there in the absence of bonus that the team had a little bit more physicality uh to them as well and you know, with a captain like Adam Lowry, who is obviously a very physical player uh, in his own right, do you think that they're going to kind of try to go a little, deviate a little bit from the identity that they've tried to build uh, over the last few years? Uh, we'll just say the end of Maurice's tenure uh, and kind of go back. This is obviously still when he was there, but you remember the 17 18 team that was like teams were scared to play Winnipeg because of how physical they were and how big their blue liners were, we'll say, uh, mm-hmm. you know, one in particular. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's, it was really sad to see him just kind of leave abruptly, but you know, he's fishing and enjoying and living his best life. So big buff will do what big buff wants to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was evident throughout his NHL career and now post-retirement. Right. I almost wonder if the players that are going to be filling in for the players that are leaving um, are going to have different skill sets, too, though, that makes playing more physical less likely than what they had this year. Because you're losing Brendan Dillon. Clearly, most they likely. See, yeah, they didn't see fit to trying to keep him from the looks of it. Yeah. Uh, so your, your Moose defenseman may, that comes up whichever one they decide to go with or for agent pickup probably isn't going to be quite as physical. Yeah. That, that is going to be a big loss in terms of physicality. And it's kind of a shame, you know, the, what, what happened with the, the scuffle and obviously what happened with it was his hand or wrist that was cut really bad. Um, you know, almost kind of reminds you of, uh, Granted, this was the end of a career and not just a tenure with a team, but the way that Brian Little went, that was really sad because he contributed between the Thrashers and the Jets. Like, you know, he contributed so much to that organization. And to go out on a note like that is is really sad, you know. Yeah, that's not what you're looking for, but Onwards and upwards, I guess. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, I don't think that we're going to be in as perplexing of a, a situation that we were, um, you know, last off season. I don't think we're going to be in that sort of um, predicament this year. 
now that we no, have we're not looking post. yeah at this point we're not looking for who are our foundational pieces it's who fits in around the foundational pieces and makes us better than we were last year mm -hmm. yeah and it's uh it's it's going to be interesting with this um with paul maurice now in the the stanley cup final and i don't know who who do you got I don't think I don't like either team. I'll be honest. Like, there's there's the. I, I think any Winnipeg fan has a just a built-in dislike for Edmonton, especially on the hockey side. Right. It's just part of the deal. Then again, Florida's not exactly a team you go out of your way to root for either, right? Unless you are one of the handful of people that goes to their games. One of the handful of locals, I should say, that goes to their games. Yeah. Well, it, 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 if they were an exciting, if they're an exciting, high flying, fun to watch team, much different. They'd be a nice casual follow for a couple weeks. That'd be fun. Now, yeah, they're they're not that. You know, too, like everyone talks about uh, how you know the south has all of these teams and you know like the north and like in Canada there's not nearly as many teams or whatever but um, I obviously population wise and tax wise uh, it makes more sense to have a hockey team in Florida but I wonder how like revenue attendance merchandise sales uh, would go if you were to say move, the Panthers to, and this kind of pains me to say a little bit, but like Regina, for example, um, you have a easy built in rivalry on both sides with Calgary and with Winnipeg. That one's an easy rivalry. Uh, but you know, you, you figure the population of Saskatchewan is probably lesser than that of Miami uh, or even sunrise. Uh, which I think that's like right outside of Miami, if my geography is correct. But yeah, it's down there somewhere. You think of the hockey hungry population of Saskatchewan that people would, you know, happily drive from Saskatoon down to Regina for a game. Uh, you know, if they had their own NHL team, you'd probably, at least in the first couple of years, you'd probably sell out the barn. You know, maybe after you lose that luster of a brand new team, like we have seen in Winnipeg, you might not sell out as many games. Uh, but I do think that there would be a lot more merchandise being sold. Uh, and there'd probably be more, uh, I can't even think of a name. I was going to make a comment that a, an old kicker made about uh, Saskatchewan, but I'm just going to refrain. Uh, but you know where I'm going with that. Yes. Uh, whatever uh whatever you name them that that name would have or that team would have all the merchandise sales all over the province and as opposed to i was gonna say you know like any sort of like marlins fans but even there like there's not just a big sports presence in miami aside from maybe the dolphins and they've also been treated like hurt by like every franchise down there so yeah why would you have a lot of casual fans uh, that said, though, you drop a TV market like that and your U.S. TV contract goes quite a bit further downwards next time around. So that's one financial argument against. The second is twofold. I mean, look at Winnipeg this past year. We weren't selling out our barn for until almost playoff time. Uh, that w had a lot to do with pricing and with kind of just the whole true north going hey you have a team come on out and doing nothing further uh, but we rehash that over and over second thing though is that the riders had that kind of problem this past year too where they weren't putting a great product on the field these past couple of years overpriced their stuff from with the new stadium and there were fewer people driving down from saskatoon there were fewer people driving from the middle of the middle of farm country it was they had a few games where they weren't they weren't even close to selling out which is yeah so you can easily burn out a market that way too so i wouldn't say it's a i wouldn't say it's a home run by any stretch 
No, you, you can't overprice, and like, that's kind of you know what happened with the the Jets and what's happening across a lot of sports, really. Um, you know, you you see how much um, you know, like some of the ticket prices now that the NFL schedules came out. Um, the Houston Texans, their uh, prices went up. I think it was like 200, 200 and some percent or something. It was like this astronomically high number. And it's like you feel bad for the Texans fan base because they have endured a lot of years of losing football. And now they finally put a good team together. They have a good quarterback. And they. And now with Amy, the even though you're making, even though we're paying our players with just TV money, here, let me get richer. Yeah. So that could, you know, I could talk till I'm blue in the face about that. Just like, you know, ticket price gouging, not just ticket price gouging, but concessions, everything. You know, it's way cheaper to either sit at home, invite a few buddies over or go to a bar to watch the game, you know. And now I'm going to go on my soapbox here just for a second and then I'll get right back off of it. But that's the real problem I think that the NFL is going to have is they're flying too close to the sun now with all of these different streaming services that they're like, well, you can only catch this game on Peacock, this one on Netflix, this one on Amazon Prime, this one on the NFL Network. And it's like once you have too many and there are going to be people that, you know, will will buy those, will, will subscribe or whatever, but that number is going to dwindle and eventually people are going to get sick of paying 70 80 extra bucks a month just to catch one game you know you might as well buy a ticket to the game yeah at that point you can buy i don't know a quarter of a ticket <laughs> yeah which someone uh calculated uh for now granted this is one of the worst fan base or fan base i'm sorry one of the worst teams uh in football their fan base i have no problem with uh the carolina panthers uh, it is actually cheaper to buy season tickets, go to every uh, Panthers home game, than it is to buy all of the different streaming services and stuff to catch every NFL game. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's it's not been easy. No, <laughs> and like I said, they're flying too close to the sun. That's gonna pose a real problem people are going to get tired of it and, you know yeah, maybe i mean th what what it's going to do though it's going to it's going to hurt your hardcore fan base and you'll start losing a few of those to become more casual but they have so many casual fans it's going to take a long time to hurt themselves financially because they're drawing better ratings now than they ever have so i think yeah. they've got They've got a few more years to screw around with us before the whole thing starts to sink in any way, shape, or form. Like yeah. once you're seeing those numbers drop, it's probably too late anyway. That's so the got thing, though, is once you see them drop, that that's when you're gonna have to fight like hell to get them back. Sure, but then there's so much, so many, and so much money involved. They won't take, I don't think they'll be hurt until there's a real change. Yeah, they're, um, like, I, I don't want to say they're too big to fail because nothing is, but they're about as close as you get. Because we, we've seen the Roman Empire fall. <laughs> we have. Well, I wasn't there for it, but well, yeah. I heard about it. <laughs> yeah, there, there's this uh, interesting place in, in Europe. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it won't be in the next like couple of years, but if if this trend keeps going, I have a, a strong feeling that something like that could it once you start to lose out on it, uh lose out on the money, lose out on the ratings, uh that's when you're really going to have to try to really fight to recoup those losses, probably fight harder than it was to initially gain uh, all those fans. Now they had their, which is exactly what True North is facing right now. Yeah, right? I was just about to. It, just about it to was a back. couple. It was. It was a couple of years after they probably crossed the point of, oh, things are going, things are 
progressing poorly to when it actually showed up in the stands. But once it did, it became a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I remember now, granted, a part of this is because I uh, live further away, but it's only a matter of two hours further away. uh, So it's not like it's that much of a difference. But uh, I used to go up to, you know, MTS place once a month, uh, you know, sometimes more than that. And now it's like I'm catching myself doing it once a season. Now with the baby, it's, you know, I have another excuse, but like if baby wasn't a part of the equation, I'd probably still only go once a year because it is just getting too expensive. Even if I stay with a buddy, uh, you know, the gas to get up there, the ticket prices, you know, the concessions. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I I have the same calculations to deal with when it comes to banjo bowl i've been doing one vacation type of thing the past couple years with montreal involved it just happened to fall really well both times yeah then montreal ottawa then banjo bowl then gray cup i mean banjo bowl and gray cup are the two i have to do but that Mm. third one i mean that's a third plane ticket at that point because i've Driving solo is against house policy. Let's call it that way. So <laughs> the plane, the plane is the easier route at that point. So, well, especially if you're going to Montreal, right? But I mean, Winnipeg's nine hours from where we're at. So, yeah. But yeah, I, you, you start drove... you start calculating gas though, and it's almost like hmm, it's almost cheaper to fly. Yeah, Not quite. But it's it's pretty a lot more comfortable, comfortable anyways. Too. Yeah. yeah, it's at least excusable. How about that? <laughs> I need to start planning better and actually flying. Do you you fly out of Minneapolis or do you take, because now they yeah. do the flights from Eau Claire to Minneapolis. Yeah, I just do the Minneapolis, but that wasn't there the, these past couple of years. It went That's away. True. Yeah, that, that was recently added. That's right. Right. Nope. So 90 minute, I because I used to fly out of Madison until right before oh that's death. right yeah so it was madison to minneapolis or madison to chicago now it's just like hey my for my connecting flight is now a 90 minute car ride mm-hmm. yeah that's not so bad at all and how long when you think of it that way what an hour and a half maybe i was gonna say the flight can't be that long right but then you know you go early you get through security all that fun stuff yeah it's not saving you a bunch of time but it's saving you a couple hours and the time that it takes to to drive there, like, you know, by the time you finally get, you know, to, to Winnipeg, all you want to do is, oh, let me just stretch out here. And you're just doing that for like 10 minutes. Right. It sucks being in a car that long. It does. Oh, we've done it. I've done it yeah. solo. But that was when I was younger. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I'm. 30 now and uh you know the last time i drove was a little rough my back was hurting by the time i got back That's yeah only more to follow <laughs> oh i drove out uh, i drove uh, the first time i drove was like 18 years ago i didn't even have like i didn't even have satellite radio or podcasts <laughs> Oof. that yeah. that reminds me when um what was this uh yeah it was right before covid I drove at the time I was living in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and I drove up to see Scooter of the uh, Elks Call. And I would I went up through North Dakota into Saskatchewan and, uh, you know, it went from Regina to Saskatoon. I stayed the night in Regina and that was when I had uh, went to that like breakfast diner that was right next to my hotel and they were from Winnipeg originally, there was all this bomber stuff there. It was great to see. Um, but I left Regina and there's that four hour stretch in between Regina and Saskatoon uh, where the road is straight and it's so flat you could watch your dog run away for days. Um, and I made the mistake of not like turning on a song while I was in Regina, not turning on a song or a playlist, you know, a song from a playlist. I just wanted to hear this one particular song. So I search it and I hit it and that song is halfway done. And I am in God's country at this point. And 
the only song that will play was the one I selected. And there was like no radio stations either. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to listen to the same song on repeat for four hours. <laughs> this is not going to be fun. And now every time I hear that song to this day, I just picture myself back on that stretch of roadway. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gosh, what was it? November 2020? Yeah, it was just the Grey Cup recently. We did. I flew to Winnipeg. My buddy and I drove over both ways instead of me flying into Regina. Mm-hmm. Just makes a lot more sense that way because he's got to drive anyway. So let's yeah. go with him and save myself a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually kind of like that ride. But I also wasn't driving, so that helps. Yeah. Wow, we really deviated from the script. I just kind of we always do. That. I mean, what what's the difference at this point? Oh, that's true. But um, yeah. So uh, I guess to land this uh, land this episode, just want to uh, get your predictions for the bomber season. Being our resident bombers expert. I would say it's not going to be much worse than last year. Last year kind of felt because BC got off to that hot start and Winnipeg was playing catch up most of the year. It didn't feel that great until say October, but it was a 14 and four season. I'm going to say 13 and five is definitely about where I see this team. Okay. Maybe yeah. another slight step back with age and missing a piece or two, but I also see BC falling back. I see Saskatchewan gaining because, I mean, the way they've ended the last two seasons have been like car crashes. So six, <laughs> the, they're going to be better than six and twelve. I kind of think ten or eleven, where they where they're finally out of the race in mid October, finally, because they will have, have Trevor Harris back. They have the health there. They have Corey Mason there now as the head coach. There's definitely a different vibe going on out there from the people I know out there. So they're going to improve just on those two fronts. Yeah. That's unfortunate. I think Winnipeg comes out on top in the West. It's just going to be a different way of doing it than last year. Yeah. It's going to take a little bit more grit this year. Mm -hmm. And they still have that. Now, you know, if, if say Winnipeg doesn't make the gray cup this year, any team that makes it from the West versus whoever makes it from the East, well, we'll hedge our bets. Do you think uh, East or West is going to take it this year? I, the only team that I see that's strong in the East right now is Montreal, but I wouldn't write off Toronto entirely, even though they have their problems, a Chad Kelly size problem for one thing. <laughs> We're just not but they are well coached. Too much. No, they are well coached. Their backup quarterback that's going to be starting, Cameron Dukes, took the Bombers three quarters and, and before he got pulled because they were done. They didn't need to win. So they were playing a preseason game against us when we needed that W really badly. They were ahead of us after three quarters with Cameron Dukes in play. So they're not, I don't think the fall off is as dramatic as people are going to make it out to be. And they're st- And they lost a lot of talent. But again, they're well coached and they have and they're well run as far as any players go. So they probably don't win the East this year. Ten wins. Montreal 12-13. I think Montreal wins the whole thing out east again. And if it's not against us in Vancouver, I don't see any other team in the West that could stop them. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. You see at home might be a tough might be a tough thing though. If that does come to pass. We'll see. I don't think that we'll be seeing Calgary there. I don't think we're seeing any team from Alberta there, no. <laughs> yeah. Although, to make to appease our Edmonton friends just a tiny bit, because I know they're listening, I do have you finishing above Calgary this year. So, <laughs> I'm good sure job winning the Turtle that. Derby. <laughs> that, so, I've only been through this town once, but it makes me think it's just real quick before we close out the show, but um, Red Deer, where's their alliance? Half and half. There's got to be. And there's a decent slice of them that are Ryder fans because there's Ryder fans everywhere. Stop it. 
I actually know a Ryder fan from Red Deer, so I could say that. That's fair. Does he watch? Uh, he helps run the Two and Out podcast, and he's a DJ out there. So, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> so you need to get his input and report back next week. Okay. I will tell him he has an assignment. There you go. Find out where the true alliance lies in Red Deer. It's got to be one or the other. It can't be half and half. We'll have to see. I suppose so. He'll probably say it's half and half, and then my point is going to be null and void. Or a third, a third and third and third, right? Or a quarter, because somehow there's going to be some Toronto fans there. Mm, probably not in Alberta. Uh, I don't know. I guess there's, unfortunately, Leafs fans everywhere. And we, That's we know true, and there's no Cowboys Alberta. fans everywhere, so there's no accounting for taste. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, not everyone can be smart, I guess. <laughs> oh, well, before I, I talk myself that. a little further into a corner here, I think it's about time we wrap this up. What do you say, Joe? Probably before we piss off every fan base in North America. I was going to say the only fan base that's probably still going to be watching this is the Winnipeg one. But, hey, this is the Winnipeg Terminal. We are clear for landing. As always, for the dub, go Jets, go.